thanks for coming out. And um, the H Shields Institute is where I come from in California, but it has uh, affiliates and network points um, right around the globe now at this point. And um, we founded this work in 1983 through one project, and it started to grow and grow and grow. And pretty soon we realized that we were holding on to something that was really needed uh, by youth, okay? However, um, without adults who can wield it, it's not very much good for the youth. And so in 95, I shifted over to working with adults and began to train community leaders w globally. And we began to uh, work in Europe over with uh, German-speaking people first. They were the first ones who gave me enough chocolate and had a most compelling story. And the woman who came over from Austria literally took my hand in her hand and she cried while saying, we really need you here. The children need you here. So, and at that point, my friend who's a Native American from Michigan, Paul Rayfield, he said, she got us. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, she said the one thing we can't say no to. And I'm, need, need. And uh, for the family, you know. So uh, he and I ended up working over there a bunch in Germany um, through a whole network of, of affiliate programs that now uh, it's gone so far as that the forest kindergarten movement now over in Germany requires our book uh, as training. They did some interesting research, which I, I want to bring to your attention straight up front, and then I'll drop into some probably some stories that will entertain all of us because I love going back and reliving these moments. Um, as much you know, as sharing them with you as a storyteller, but there was some research done in Germany not too long uh, after this network got started because there was an assumption that was made and spoken about, which was, um, you know, we have no nature connection problem in Germany because we got this forest kindergarten thing going on and it's one of the best in the world and it's been going for a long time and so we know it's covered, right? And then there was a researcher who was watching over this whole thing, he said, I don't see consistency. Um, and uh, he's working with this woman, uh, for, uh, Susanna, and she says to me, you know, we used the eight attributes of connection, which I'll talk about tonight, and we did sort of a survey of the children after several years of being in the forest kindergartens, and we found that the children from this class all had these attributes of connection. The children from this class didn't. And so they looked to the teachers. The teacher here had all the attributes of connection. The teacher here didn't. Both of them had really good marks in university for forest kindergarten training pedagogy. And that pointed at something, and I hope you hear what I'm saying. They both got good grades at university to be forest kindergarten teachers. The one who was, had the attributes of connection was capable of getting the children to the attributes of connection. The ones who didn't have the attributes of connection were not capable because connection doesn't happen through pedagogy, <laughs> period, okay? And this is one of the most misunderstood things in the Western world right now, and it's the thing that, I, that I'm on about the most right now, and I think it's probably the most important thing for me to say to you, that connection modeling is different from educational modeling. You want to get educational results? Use education. If you want to get connection results, use connection modeling. And then you're asking yourself, what is connection modeling? That's the best question you could be asking because we actually don't know what that is in the Western world. We lost it hundreds of years ago. It's gone. But the San Bushmen didn't lose it, nor did the Apaches that mentored my mentor. They hadn't lost it either. And I majored in college, double major, natural history and anthropology so that I could study both nature and the people who lived in nature and to find out one question, why are some groups of people amazing at connecting everyone to nature and why are some groups of people absolutely bad at it? So who do you think won absolutely bad at it? <laughs> Does anybody think they're associated with that group of people? Let's be honest now. Okay, so the Western world uh, got the worst marks, and actually, I would, I would say, I would go further to say that the Western world actually became amazing at disconnecting people. 
not only from nature but from themselves and from each other. So now we're in a world of co-located human beings who are socially unrelated in most connective ways. They live in the same area, they share the same zip code, but you hear over and over and over again that they've gone out to their mailbox a hundred times over the last 50 years or whatever and they've never met the neighbor over here. Right? This story is more and more common. People are co-located but unconnected. And they're unconnected with themselves and more and more unconnected with their own families, their own ancestry, and they're absolutely getting more and more disconnected from the earth. And as this continues to go, and Richard Louvre, who's probably known to a lot of you in the room, raise your hand if you've heard of Richard Louvre or nature deficit disorder. If you've heard of that, you've heard of Richard Louvre because he coined that term. Um, he wrote a best-selling book in the U.S. Uh, that came out in 2005, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, and he didn't say anything new because some of the research was already 30 years old that he was bringing forward, but it was clear that when children grow up with nature in a particular way, they're healthier, happier, smarter, more creative, more well-adjusted, more spiritually grounded, centered, like, let's put it this way. When you find out what nature connection does for a child, you want, everybody wants their children to be nature connected. So the problem is that, um, you know, he wrote that book in 2005. He got some, somewhere over 40 million people involved in the Children and Nature Network in the U.S. And then it spread to 80 countries, right? And he was speaking in San Francisco recently and he said, you know, the, the troubling thing here is that this book has been out there. There's uh, 80 countries involved and there's, you know, now over a billion people collectively talking about this problem and it hasn't shifted at all. As a matter of fact, it's getting worse. And he points out that one of the reasons that he thinks that's true is because educators keep trying to wield connection. And I'll tell you why that's a bad idea. Because it would be like saying, I want big biceps, so I'm going to read a book on it. Right? You wouldn't use that as a way to get big biceps. You'd actually go and you know, work out your biceps in a you know, recreational fitness model. <laughs> so you wouldn't use recreational fitness modeling to get educational results, right? But that's what people are doing. They're trying to get nature connection results using educational modeling or outdoor recreation modeling. But connection will only yield to connection modeling. Does this make sense? Okay, so I think it's super important, and I just want you to be thinking about for a moment one question. When have you felt most connected to a person, to an animal, to a place? Think about the things that you feel really connected to, that you love so much, that you care so much about. How did you get that way with that, whether it's another person, or a place, or an oak tree, or an animal? How did it happen? And then think about reverse engineering that path and applying it to all aspects of the natural world and then look around at our society and you'll realize that we're not attending to that at all. And that if you look back to when people got nature connected, so the international conservation movement, for instance, how many trillions of dollars are spent every year on conservation, is basically aging out. Because all the people who are in conservation today grew up before television. They grew up before computers and what did they do? They played outside all the time and they played with other kids without adults supervising them and because they did the biology kicked in and the connection system if you will woke up and connection occurred between those people and nature the result of that is that they fell in love with nature when they were able to they began to volunteer they began to donate and they helped fund create and drive the conservation movement but what I'm consulting on right now with big conservation groups globally is how do we get more members because everyone's aging out Right? No one's coming in to fill in the bottom. And people will say, well, that's because you're not being relevant. You know, you're not using enough social media. <laughs> <laughs> and so they do that kind of stuff and they respond and they try to become more relevant to the younger generation. But the bottom line is the younger generation doesn't even know why, what I care about. Like nature, okay, well, there's tires and there's sneakers and there's nature and there's sunglasses. You know, that's how it looks to them. Right? It's just one of the things. And it's because there's no connection there. And, uh, so what they do is they throw lots of money into education to drive nature connection and nothing changes. So they're basically putting that money to right down the drain, right? Because we don't get connection except through connection modeling.
Okay, so the job of a culture is to connect. That's what the culture's job is. It helps people connect. And this was discovered, uh, you know, through my research, this was, you know, clearly evident that it was the culture that was causing connection to happen at a high level in all these groups of people around the world. And that it was also clear that the Western society was born, literally, when the culture that was in place in time was destroyed by a conquering nation and it was replaced with something else. The culture was never restored after that moment and now we all live in the historic uh, memory of that loss of culture and we don't really have a culture anymore. So don't, don't actually make the mistake of calling the Western society Western culture because it doesn't connect. It excels in disconnection, so it's really the unculture. Does that make sense? So what is culture? Don't look in Wikipedia. I warned everybody this weekend. <laughs> because they'll do 69 pages or 70 pages on what culture uh, has done, like artifacts. It's like nouns. It's the opera. Oh, it's art. No, it's, you know, and by the time you're done reading it, you're like, what is culture? I have no idea what culture is. You're more confused after reading it. And that's because it isn't what culture is, it's what culture does that you really should focus on. And one, let me give you an example of a cultural element for a moment. And it's a greeting custom. So when I go visit uh, the San Bushman in, in Botswana and I go spend time with these people who are still living their traditional culture, um, we're going to hang out with them for maybe an hour and a half this morning before it gets too hot and then everyone's going to go in the shade. But they'll spend 45 minutes greeting us. 45 minutes, and that means every single person will greet every single person slowly and surely. We don't speak their language, but it doesn't matter because they're going to hold your hand in their hand. They put their, their hands here very humbly, and they bow down, and they speak to you in this gentle way, and they look at you in the eye, and they say all these really, it just feels really sweet what they're saying. You have no idea what they're saying because there's only one translator, and there's so many of us and so many of them. But that goes on for 45 minutes. And then we finally sit with them, and then they want to know, all about us. So layer two greeting custom, they have to hear from every single person. A story. Who are you? Where are you from? You know, what about your family? Tell us about your family, right? Greeting custom level two. By that time, we're done. We haven't done anything but that. And then they say goodbye because it's getting hot. <laughs> so then we all go around and we do that 45 minute unraveling of the greeting <laughs> because we're not going to see each other for two hours. So we go and rest in the heat of the day, we come back in the afternoon, the whole thing repeats as if they haven't seen us before. <laughs> the only thing that doesn't happen the second time is that we don't have to tell them who we are and about our family and where we're from because they got that. <laughs> but they will spend another 45 minutes greeting you back in and it's only been two hours, right? It's, so it started to occur to me that these were the best trackers in the world, but everybody in Africa was saying these, the Bushmen are by far the most amazing trackers. They can do things that no one else seems to be able to do. They're connected at such a level, it's hard, it's hard to imagine how good they are at tracking, okay? So, and you can't imagine that they're doing this. Unless you know what they're doing, you wouldn't notice. So I'll just give you one example. <clears throat> so one day, we were, uh, we'd just spent, oh gosh, quite a long time chasing a zebra that had been attacked by a leopard. And this one Bushman hunter, Guta, he said, you know, to the translator, we should get this zebra before the hyenas and the lions get it because it could feed the whole village and it's wounded, so it'll be easy to get it, right? So we ended up running for probably 45 minutes without stopping following this zebra across the Kalahari. After a while, it stopped bleeding, and after it stopped bleeding, it stopped limping, and then it joined the herd and went into the darkness into an acacia thorn kind of scrub area that was like black. It was just so black that you couldn't see into it. And the sun had already set. And now it was pitch black. And you could hardly see your hand in front of your face at the edge of that forest. So we stepped out from under that canopy back into the starlight because there was no moon, right? And it was cloudy kind of you know, place. And we're in the middle of the central Kalahari. So there's, there's like no city lights or nothing out there. And this Bushman turns to us and he says the three words in English that he knows I know. Dark, leopard, truck. Then it occurs to me, we don't have a flashlight. We don't have a rifle. There's a leopard out here with us. <laughs> we just chased its thing that it, like leopards don't like 
when you get involved, okay? <laughs> and we had been very involved, okay? So it's typical for a leopard to follow you if you mess with its kill, right? So it will follow you. So dark leopard truck, this is what he says. And I suddenly realized that the central Kalahari is perfectly flat. There is no tours around that you can see in the distance that you can use as landmarks. You know, there's no, it's just flat, okay? And we're in this roadless, trackless, flat wilderness, and it's getting dark, and I'm responsible for the people that are with me. And now I'm realizing that I made a terrible mistake saying yes to this bushman to chase this thing until it got dark. Well, he goes like this, with his hand, and he just starts walking, right? <laughs> through the night, just bursting through bushes, and we're all supposed to follow him. He's shouting over his shoulder to the translator, follow me, follow me, you know? So we just followed him. He walked, I'm telling you, like some, you know what a chalk line is when you snap a chalk line, a perfectly straight line. He never veered left or right straight for about 20 minutes without stopping. We burst out of the bush and there's the truck. Okay. I was impressed with the running after the zebra. Okay. And following it at a dead run for 45 minutes without stopping. But the truck thing really caught my attention. I'd like to be able to do that. Would anyone else like to be able to do that? Because we think of nature connection like, okay, he's got truck connection also. So he doesn't, seem, <laughs> he doesn't seem to have like a prejudice around it, whether it's nature or not, you know? So a couple years later, I was out with a group of tracker trainees. These are people who'd spend considerable years trying to become good trackers. Now, don't ask me why modern people would want to become good trackers, because one, you won't get a job. Two, if you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you're going to lose them, and it won't get you a new one, okay? <laughs> and... There's an old saying, and it goes something like this, you know, what do you call a tracker who just broke up with his girlfriend? Homeless. So <laughs> it's, but I still train trackers, and I have since I was, you know, in my early 20s, and now I'm in my 50s, so I've been doing this for a long time, and I've been studying tracking as a phenomenon among indigenous people, and I'm really, really fascinated by it, but I, honestly, modern people who become obsessed with tracking I worry about them, and I usually adopt them as family members because at least they'll get meals when they're in my neighborhood, okay? Um, but I had a couple of these guys, and they've been doing this for 10, 12 years. One guy's an ex-police officer, and um, he had a, a, an injury on the job that got, actually made it so he couldn't be a police officer anymore, and he had to retire um, and just fell in love with tracking. So he had the disposable income and the time on his hands to do this, so he kind of makes sense. And he's an elder now, but he's a great guy. And uh, there's another guy that's been tracking for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. Another white-haired guy. Super into it. And then I'm also with the uh, world-famous Grammy Award-winning bass player, Victor Wooten. Do you know, know, know Victor Wooten? Anybody raise your hand if you know Victor. Victor loves tracking, okay? So as much as he loves music, he loves tracking. So we've got this guy, and he can't wait to go tracking with Guta, okay, this pushman. So we follow a cheetah for nine kilometers, zigzagging all over the Kalahari in the heat of the day. We're all sunburned. We've run out of water, and we're very tired. And again, Guta's chasing this cheetah at a run the whole time. The cheetah pulls the fast one and gets under a farmer's fence and disappears over here. Um, and we decide at that point, okay, we've had enough. And then I said to the trackers, I said, now, did you like what you just saw? Guta doing. Oh, that was amazing. I said, but wait, what he's about to do is even more amazing. They're like, what could be more amazing than that? I said, watch what he does and follow him and tell me if he veers left or right. Follow him and tell me if he veers left or right. And they're looking at me like, what are you talking about? So I said to the translator, ask Guta if he can find the truck, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he's bent over and he's under the fence, you know, looking where the last marks of the cheetah have gone. He stands up, his hand goes like this drops and he just starts walking okay so i tell those guys follow him follow him line up behind him and look for straight lines across the landscape see if he goes left or right he was crashing through thorn bushes to keep that straight line about what five kilometers pops out the truck is directly in front of his hand again right and they're just like what just happened and i'm like that's what i'm saying what just happened what is that what, what is that phenomenon? Who are these people? What do they have that we don't have? Or do we have it and we just haven't used it? And it's sort of atrophied, right? Because another guy I know who worked for a long time with them, he said, <coughs> he said, you know, I don't believe in these spiritual things. You know, I'm a reductionist, mechanistic scientist, <laughs> like the rest of my friends. But there are some things I just can't explain. And he says, so never tell people my name, but you can tell the stories. 
So I said, okay. So he said, there was this one time that I just can't explain. And this Bushman, we had hired him for a particular study where there was a, a, a collar on a particular kind of antelope which had 500 in the herd. So it was a big herd animal. Nothing particular about this animal that made its tracks outstanding or anything. It was, you know, one of 500. Okay, males and females are slightly different. It's got a collar on and it's got a purple ear tag. And the collar it's wearing is a radio collar. So they're using telemetry to study it. But the study, this guy's money is based on having met this animal at birth, following it through its entire life until it dies. So the study is funded based on the entire lifespan of this animal and it dying, its death, whatever that ends up being. Okay. So one day he wakes up. He's under a lot of stress doing this thing. It's a lot of work to follow animals around with radio telemetry equipment. You know, the stuff is heavy and then it's hot and, you know, it's really difficult work for these guys. And, you know, the Bushmen are keeping them from dying quite a bit. It's, this one man had said the Bushmen saved his life three times, not one, but three times. So you think about these studies without Bushmen, what would happen? <laughs> there would be no study for sure because there'd be no scientist. Um, so out comes the scientist one morning and he's just got his hands like this and he's crying, you know, he's literally crying. And the Bushman comes out and says, what's wrong with the boss? And he said, he found the radio collar, but no animal. So he's crying because he's lost his funding and he can't finish this thing anymore, you know, and it's dry season, all the ground is hard as stone, like it's hard pan, you know, it's like the clay has dried in the sun, it's super hard. And the Bushman says, why don't we just put the collar back on the animal? <laughs> and the translator and the scientist are just like, well, no, we, well, we can't do that. And he's like, well, why not? We can just go over to it and put the collar back on. And he says, no, no, we can't. There's 500 of them, and it could be anywhere. There's millions of acres. We don't know where it is. You know, they've been moving a lot in the last few days. It's gone. It's over. The bushman mutters to himself, picks up the collar, and just starts walking. And... <laughs> He's, he's got his hand out in front of him and he's talking while he's walking, you know, and he's got his hand out and he's just walking like this. He's got the collar on his other arm. He's just doing this for about 45 minutes. So they start following him. And the scientist says to the translator, if this is a joke, um, I will kill myself. Okay. <laughs> right. This is really bad news. And this better, this is not in any way funny. I hope this is not what you guys think is going to be funny. They think the Bushman's playing a trick. He goes for about 45 minutes, he gets to this little hill, and the hills aren't very common out there, but he gets to this little hill so you can't see beyond it, and he uses the hill for a visual block, so he like kind of veers and then goes and uses the hill and waves these guys to be quiet, come this way, come this way, and then he stops them at the hill and he tells the guy with the rifle with the tranquilizing dart, you know, come up, because the animal's just on the other side of that hill resting in the shade. He hasn't even seen the animal, okay? All from the tracks. Which, by the way, my friend said, you couldn't see. You couldn't see what the Bushman was seeing because it was like he was following something that was painted on the ground as clear as like the stripes on a road, but we couldn't see anything that this guy was seeing, right? But he was not only getting the information where the animal went, he was getting nuanced information like it's tired, it's going to rest soon. And he also knows that they rest in certain kinds of uh, trees that they favor. So he's got all this ecological knowledge feeding his tracking skills. You see that? Well, they walk up to the hill. The translator's the first to look because nobody else wants to look because they're afraid. But they look and he sees and he goes, right? Comes back, he says, purple ear tag, resting under the tree like the Bushman said. So they got saved the study. So that's an example, right, of tracking skill. You never even thought of that, right? <laughs> like when I heard that story, I'm like, that is so cool because you hear so many layers of awareness, connection, attention, in ecological knowledge, all this stuff coming into this one individual, and a lot of them can do this kind of stuff, you know? They all grow up this way. Well, it gets more interesting than that. Because mm -hmm. my same friend says to me, okay, it gets stranger, he says, but this one really got me. Because I'd been living with this one family for 10 years, doing research. I was adopted by the family. I knew their language fluently. They knew me and loved me and treated me very kindly. But they live way out in the Kalahari. There's no phones, there's no internet, there's no way to communicate with them. They don't know what Monday is because as far as they're concerned, Monday is our problem. They don't even understand why we made up something like Monday or Tuesday, <laughs> right? 
they cannot relate to the idea that we would measure time at all. Like, they're just like, why would you do that, you know? And I learned a really valuable lesson around that one from these guys. But so he basically said, so when you're leaving South Africa and you're driving several days up to Botswana and then back on these dirt roads out into the middle of the bush, you don't even know if you're going to find them. Because the best you can do is park where you parked last time you were here and then walk in the direction where they were last camped and hope that you find some Bushman footprints. And if you do, you follow them. But he said, sometimes it takes me two, three weeks to find them because I don't know where they are because they don't stay in one place for very long. They're hunter-gatherer nomads, right? So he gets out to this place. He pulls his truck up. Now, he's been on the road five, six days now from leaving his home. Pulls up to this place where there's a little rock outcropping that goes across a little geological layer where it flipped up so there's like this little saw blade of rock that sticks up about this high in certain places and he parks here with this big thorn tree over it to give it shade, the vehicle. And as he's pulling in to park and just straightening out his Toyota Land Cruiser and just getting it straight, out of the bush comes this bushman who is like his brother. And he says, oh, that's convenient, <laughs> you know, you're here. He says, yes, I came to help you carry your things. <laughs> and he said, why? He said, because the village is four days walk. <laughs> so he's like, what do you mean? When did you get here? He says, well, I just got here when you got here. <laughs> so he studies the footprints of the Bushmen and realizes, indeed, the tracks didn't break stride. They just walked up. So he had timed his arrival so that he would arrive at the same time as my friend. And so this whole time, my friend is thinking, okay, so who's putting me on? Like, which one of my friends radioed to these guys <laughs> that I was coming and all this? So he's looking for all this evidence that there's this elaborate prank being played on him. When he gets to the village, the first thing he does, he starts talking to the people who are most likely not to be involved in pranks, <laughs> who are like his family members, elders and things like that. And he says, you know, what about this guy, you know? How come he showed up in my car? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like nine days ago, he said he was heading over because you were on your way and that he would meet you at the car and help you carry your things. So, and everyone just kept saying it, totally straight face, completely relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. And he never uncovered the prank, right? And he said, you know, if that had happened once, it would have been remarkable. But I started to see them do that kind of thing over and over and over again. So these are phenomena of connection, not education. Now, something you need to know about education with the Bushmen is that when they're 12 to 15 years old, they already score 100% on an eco-literacy exam that was developed for the master level trackers in that region, okay? They brought the scientists in and gave them the same exam and they were averaging below 10% on the ability to answer the questions about the basic ecological knowledge of the plants, animals, and everything in the Kalahari. So what does that tell you? They are not unintelligent and they're not uneducated. Yes, they're illiterate. They cannot read and write our language, but they can sure read and write in the natural language of the Kalahari. They're extraordinarily intelligent people, amazing problem solvers, great debaters. Uh, my one friend, uh, another friend of mine who works with them in the Kalahari wrote a book called uh, The Art of Tracking the Origin of Science. It's Louis Liebenberg, and he believes that they're better scientists than most modern trained scientists because they will not risk error in their experimentation because if you make a mistake in the Kalahari, what are the results? You, you could die. You could kill your children with false information. So they're absolutely committed to the highest level of integrity in observation, experimentation, and conclusion. They theorize, they're creative, they're fun, they're funny, they act, they tell stories, they dance, they sing, they write music, all the things we do. And they do it all at a very high level. They also, people have studied leadership skills in humans and have said that these people, they don't have leaders, they don't need them, because every single person is raised to be a leader. So we have leaders because we don't raise leaders. And we need re leaders every so many head to keep us from falling apart. But they basically go one step further and say, no, we should all be leaders. We should all be visionary. We should all be intelligent. We should all be great problem solvers. We should all stand on our own two feet, have self-determination, have our own beliefs and views of the world. And they're very egalitarian and democracy-oriented, right? 
but they lack one key thing for modern times. You know what that is? iPhones. <clears throat> no, that's not it. The, the one key thing they lack for modern times is that they unfortunately don't have this one gene that we all have. Do you know what that gene is? It's called the war gene. You know, human beings, every single human being on the planet, according to genetic studies that are now widely known, widely you can find this information on the internet yourself right now, in the last few years, it's become evident that every single living human being on planet Earth traces back through their ancestry directly to the San Bushman. So, do, do you understand what I just said? The people I'm describing are our ancestors. Okay, we all come from them. Think about that for a minute. That tracking ability, you have it inside you. It's hardwired in you. It's just not activated. Right? You have it. That's your nature connection system fully activated. So, the one problem is that, you know, humans popped out of the top of Africa starting somewhere around 60,000 years ago, maybe? I don't know, it's sort of... There's a debate around it because they're trying to figure out how did the aboriginals end up in Australia at 55, 60,000 years ago if people only left the no northern part of Africa 60,000 years ago. So they're basically saying maybe it was more like 75,000 when people started to spill out the top of Africa and make their way around and down into Australia. But you can trace now like a big tree the pathway of every genetic line on the planet. And you know the Europeans, you know where we came from, it's kind of interesting. My ancestors went up northeast, west, and then south into Europe, right? That was our route. Well, we first went northeast into Asia and out that way. And then a bunch of people went west over the land bridge into the North American continent and then populated down from the top. And then there's some people who just did really strange things and they just suddenly appear genetically in the midst of other people that clearly they came from the sea or something because nobody knows where they came from. But this all points at something important, which is that, you know, whatever these people are hardwired to do, we are hardwired to do. And some interesting things start to happen. You know, I, my research, before I knew the Bushmen were our ancestors, I was researching who are the most nature-connected people on the planet, right? And it kept coming up, the Bushmen. No matter where I went, it was the Bushmen. And it seemed like the further you got from the Kalahari, the less connected people were almost like there was a trail being left. And I discovered that supernature connected people in the North American continent were actually a subset of the population. So they literally would see a child who seemed to be predisposed to skill in nature, and they would separate that child and raise them separately to be supernature connected. And then that child would become a scout or a shaman or something important within the culture. But that puts a lot of pressure on that individual, right? And when you get back to the Kalahari, you discover that all children are raised equally. All of them end up with this incredible connection. Do you see what I'm saying? The further you get from the Kalahari, the less connection emphasis is occurring for everyone involved. I started to ask a simple question in 79. What are they doing, these super connected people that we're not? And can we model it? Can we pull it out of what they're doing, shake it away from its oral tradition and linguistic specifics, look at it and say, this is a model that works for anyone. My example, greeting custom. So I'm working at an all-boys Catholic high school, <laughs> which was an academy, because it was the first client that said yes to my offering to run a project for kids. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, why not? I ran an after-school program for them on Tuesdays for an hour and a half, and I started thinking, okay, we need a greeting custom. So, do you ever gone into a classroom and had a greeting custom done? You got a 90 minute class, 45 minutes are tied up in greeting. <laughs> everyone comes in, everyone shakes everyone's hand, takes a little while, hears each other's story, right? And then they all sit down finally. First day of class, everyone has to tell where they're from and about their family and all that, and then the class is over, so there's no homework from that day. It doesn't really happen in educational modeling, right? We don't really think about greeting customs. And, I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know about greeting customs either because these kids, you know, they're all like super, they had to take tests to get in this school, they're ultra focused, they're like sports stars, they're super busy, they're trying to get into like Yale and Princeton and, you know, MIT and, right? This is who these kids are. Greeting custom. 
It's not going to go over well. This is New Jersey, 1983. And I don't think you know that what I'm even talking about when I say that, right? Anyone ever been to New York? New York City, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Hey, what's up? That's my greeting custom, what's up? Right? Yeah. That's the response, that's standard. Um, doesn't take but half seconds, very efficient. And we get right down to things, okay? So I've got all these kids, you know, 14, 15 years old, and I tell them in the first couple of days of this every Tuesday club thing, we have to come up with a greeting custom. Oh, so that was funny to them. They're like, greeting custom, I got one for you, Mr. Young. Uh, it's rated R, though. Is that all right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're joking, you know, and they have all these funny, and they joke around about it. But then they say, okay, well, what is a greeting custom? What do you mean by a greeting custom? I'm like, well, here's what a greeting custom looks like among the San. Here's what it looks like among the Zulus. Here's what it looks like in, in among the, this, you know, that one that they do in New Zealand, the uh, Maori. You know, I said, we're not going to do that one. It's a little elaborate. And so we looked at basically the elements and the attributes of a greeting custom and we said, well, it seems like it needs to have a little time around it. You know, it's like an opportunity for people to kind of shed whatever happened during the day, arrive, say hello, maybe be grateful for something. I, you know, these are the things that are in it. What do you guys think? And so they all talked among themselves and they came up with this idea. What they were going to do is sit in a circle and one by one they would just say what they, what they liked about their day, what they didn't like about their day, and what they wanted to do in club today. And that was their greeting custom, okay? And they, and they gave each other, oh, the other thing, the rule was that everyone had to listen to each other. <laughs> that was my rule, because if I didn't make that rule, they wouldn't. So I said, it's important that you sit and listen to each other and just really be present. And they were like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so I don't really know if this 10 minutes is worth it, and I'm not sure if this experiment is going anywhere. But I want to show you connection modeling all of a sudden and how I discovered there is legitimate things going on in connection modeling that we are not paying attention to at all. We've completely lost the understanding of why they are, matter so much, okay? So it's about three months in. I got my eyes closed and I'm listening, which I often do. I put my head down and I close my eyes and I really want to listen, you know? Don't want to be distracted. And I'm listening to these young guys. The first guy talks, the second guy talks, the third guy talks. Gets to the fourth guy, but he doesn't say anything and I'm, my eyes are closed. I got my head down, but there's a long pause, longer than normal. And all of a sudden, tears well up in my eyes. And I'm still looking down. You know what I mean? My eyes are closed. When I lift my head and open my eyes and look, this guy's not talking yet. He's swallowing real hard, and he's got tears running down his cheeks. And the other boys in the circle have tears running down their cheeks. Nobody has said anything yet. Why is he crying? But the other boys are already crying. What does that tell you about connection right there? How is that different from the Bushman knowing that that man was coming four days before he arrived? It's the same phenomenon. You see it? I didn't know anyone was crying, and I started crying. I didn't even know why I was crying. Okay? This is field phenomenon. This is connection phenomenon we're talking about here. Okay? So what happens is... He finally swallows hard a couple of times, and out of his mouth comes these words. He said, I am number one in, the cl in my class, which was true. He was number one out of 250. He was the number one student in his class. He says, I go to the best school in the state. I come from one of the best families in the county, I am told. And he just starts saying all of the honors and things that he carries and the pressure he's under as an individual. And he says, but you are the only people who let me be me, who see me for who I really am, and who love me. And I know that, and I love you guys so much. And this is, this, these kinds of words would never come out of a Jersey boy at 15 in 1985, whenever this was, okay? He says, I'm gonna give my life to nature. I'm gonna work for the environment, and today he's a great environmental lawyer, right? And this is connection. You see it? He was 15. He was 15. That's 85. So, another young man from two years later, he's got um, a propensity to irritate his parents. <laughs> he, he, his parents want, his father's a surgeon, and his mother's like a very high level administrator for a big business. And 
they, these guys cut to the chase, okay? Everything is done very efficiently. And the older brother is really excelling in everything. And the younger brother, the one I'm talking about now, he's kind of rebelling, okay? He listens to John Lennon music all the time, <laughs> does artwork, draws all over his clothes, right? He's got to wear a suit and tie at Christian Brothers every day, but on the back of his shirt that you can't see, he's drawn a whole mural with a magic marker, but he keeps his coat on so no one can see it, you know. So he's going this route, and the parents are really worried about him. Um, but I'm not worried about him at all, because one, you know, I got some other kids that have been sent to my club because they're dipping into some serious drug abuse, okay? And through the work we're doing, they're getting over their addictions. For sure, it's happening, okay? Um, and we didn't really know that this work was consistent in that way at the time, okay? But that ended up causing it to go around the world because we started to get on the radar of drug and alcohol inner city programs. Because we're, we're now we're being asked, come to the inner city, help younger siblings of uh, drug abusers because they have a high risk of becoming drug abusers. So can you get in there and do something for them? So I designed a whole program there and it worked brilliantly. And so that suddenly we were like working with the state adjudicated youth programs and all the incarcerated children and then all the youth homes and high schools everywhere. And pretty soon I realized, okay, there's something in what we're doing that's really needed by children, especially now. I mean, the suicide rate of teens has gone way up, too high to talk about. It really upsets me to think about it because there's a huge crisis with our youth right now on the planet in the modern, postmodern world. And we really need to wake up to that because if we could wield connection modeling towards them, which is not even hard to do, because it's not even rocket science. It's actually fun and loose and creative, <laughs> all the things that we're terrified of. But <laughs> if, if we could bring that stuff back and wield it effectively and connect ourselves to nature, we could save a whole generation of young people. And I think the planet at the same time, because you raise another generation of conservationists. And I know that to be true, because I see it in microcosmic areas everywhere this work is taking root. You see it happening. Full transformation of the people involved. But back to our friend. He finishes high school and he decides he's going to art school. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't send you to this academy so you go on to be an artist. Convinced him to try architecture. He got in there, came out of architecture school and started winning awards for the most amazing buildings built in Dubai and these other, Paris and these other places right out of college. And they said he was a savant in his ability to visualize complex multidimensional uh, objects and also predict their behavior, right? So he had all this incredible ability. And he said, no, it's because of the way I was mentored by John and Ingwe. They're the ones who gave me this skill. All my friends have it too, right? And what were we, what were we doing? We were just teaching them to be storytellers. We were teaching them to go out on the land because the Bushmen, the Yakamba, the Apaches, all these people who were our role models, put a high value on storytelling. Everybody was a storyteller, not just the storyteller. But there was a class of people who were even better storytellers who were called storytellers. But you get among the sun and this is what you see. The children go out, have an experience. They come back in, a bunch of elders sit them down, ask them a whole bunch of questions. What did you do? Where did you go? And they ask him to tell the story of the day. It's a core routine. All of you who have had the instinct to sit at the dinner table and ask your children, how was your day, were responding to that mandate of your nervous system that drives connection. The problem is we didn't share context with our children, so they rebel against the story of the day. Because my mom was a real estate agent, she's working all day in her office, I'm in school hating every minute of it because I'd rather be out in the woods playing with my friends, right? I come back and sit at the table, she asks me how was my day, I can't relate it to her because she won't relate to it, she was totally somewhere else. But when I go back and relive those times at the dinner table, when my mom would say to me, Jonathan, the, the little sparrows in the bush, I think the eggs hatched, I heard them begging. And I'd be like, oh, that's so cool. And then we'd run out together and we'd look, right? And then if she talked about the morning doves cooing from the wire, we would talk about it. And it's not just because it's nature. It's because it's a shared context. She is talking about something I find relevant. I'm talking about something she finds relevant. And once that doorway is open, then we can talk about other things and laugh together. But connection has to happen first. Witness the Bushman greeting custom for 45 minutes before getting down to business, right? So asking for the story of the day right at the dinner table 
first five seconds, that's a connection modeling failure moment. Then you start to wonder, boy, should I even be asking my kid about their day? Of course you should. That's exactly what you should be doing. But you got to yield into the connection model and move into it so you set the timing of when you start asking that question and you build common context first. Right? Because there are no two human beings who can go out and have an experience. You go that way, I'll go this way on the same land when we come back. I want to know what you saw. You're going to want to know what I saw just because I know you went that way. That's instinctive also. Right? I watch that all the time and it's so fun to watch that evolve with people. Right? Well, the thing about the Bushmen is that they do that two or three times a day for their whole life. So by the, by the time they're in their 50s, 60s, their storytelling ability is so unbelievable and their mental mapping capability, how they can see their landscape and all this dimensional clarity is just off the charts. When you interview them about that kind of stuff, it just blows your mind, you know, what they're capable of. You know, and then you start feeling guilty that you can't name the street one street away from your street, right? But these guys can like tell you that all where all these trees are and where all this where these animals like to bed down and where the water comes and when the seasonal rains happen, which parts get wet, which ones stay dry, and they just know all of it for hundreds of miles around themselves. You know, it's amazing, and they visualize it in their mind. You see the visualization thing I was talking about with that young architect who's now in his 40s and totally on top of his career. That's why I said there's genius in this, right? It's, this is us at our best. Nature connection isn't just good for nature deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. Nature connection actually optimizes our nervous system. And it makes us nature smart, as Richard Luce says. But I'll take it one step further, because every oral tradition, every ancient story says that genius comes from nature. We get it from nature. And us being in relationship with nature activates our genius. So, I don't even want to talk about this as a therapy or a rehabilitation. I want to talk about it also as the fact that it optimizes human consciousness. All the Bushman stories I'm telling you are optimized people. The thing they're missing is the war gene. Do you know what I mean by that? What happened? People left Africa. They got into conflict. Somewhere in Asia, Europe, a bunch of conflict took place. PTSD set in, PTSD transformed the genetic material, out comes this thing called the war gene, it comes southward and enters with people who are repopulating Africa from the north-south, and those people are warriors, they don't have any problem taking human life, they can do it freely, and they just move southward and they just completely destroy the Bushman communities all the way through the whole continent, and the only place the Bushmen survive is in the central Kalahari. And the only reason they survive there is because nobody wants it. It's too hot. You can't do animal husbandry in this place. You know, too many lions, not enough surface water, uh, super intense electric, electrical storms. You know, it's a very dangerous place and you can't really live there. So when the Bushmen retreated into this place, no one followed them. So that's why they're alive today. But they are our ancestors. And the thing that really strikes me about this story is that those people in Botswana that I work with now, they don't own their own land. They can't get jobs. They don't want to. They're unemployable. They live off the land completely off the skills of their ancestors. They just want to live. And they don't have land. And so we started working with them about seven years ago, realizing that they were the grand masters of nature connection. <laughs> We told them what problem we were trying to solve. They said, we'd like to help you with that. And we started to think about, now how can we get San Bush? You can't pull them out of the sun. We can't take them out of the Kalahari because they won't do well. They won't even go inside houses. And when you move them in trucks, they won't come in the cab. They'll only ride in the back. They think something's wrong with houses because people who go in houses too much are kind of different. They seem to drift away from nature. And they're no longer human, they think. It's not a bad observation, really, if you think about it from their perspective, right? They have a 230,000 year tradition going in this place. And they just see people getting crazy who spend too much time in houses. So they, don't, they think there's something really wrong with them. So they don't go in them, right? So you can't travel with them. So I can't bring them here and have them lecture because it wouldn't make sense anyway. They wouldn't even know what to tell you, right? 
So what they agreed to do instead was to work remotely through video feeds and we're going to basically take one nature connection behavioral element at a time, one cultural element at a time. And we're going to have them demonstrate them, you know, live in their cultural context. And then what we'll do from there is we'll pull out pieces and we'll have uh, neurologists and occupational therapists and various experts on nature connection talk about why that works in our human nervous system. And then we'll talk to people who have been affected by it. And you're going to hear some really powerful stories from people who have been directly affected by these little things that are so simple that we step right over them because they're, they seem too silly, right? They seem too loose. They seem too creative. They're not organized enough. They're not structured enough. We can't control them because connection is none of those things, is it? Go back and relive the people you fell in love with. It wasn't structured. It was probably unstructured, unsupervised, and dare I say it, timeless. And maybe it didn't even have a destination. Uh-oh. <laughs> I was working with Dasan Bushman one day, <clears throat> and I had this right here from this belt loop right here was a little plastic carabiner watch from uh, the outdoor store REI in America. I thought, oh, that looks like a cool watch, you know? You just clip it right here. You want to know what time it is? You just flip it up. It just hangs out there. The thing I noticed about it, which you probably noticed too, is that you look at it, and then you put it down, and then someone asks you what time it is, and then you have to look at it again because you don't actually know what time it is. You ever do that? Is that just me? Anyone else ever do that? They look at their watch, and then someone says, oh, I saw you look at your watch. What time is it? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> well, you just looked at your watch. I know, but i got to look at it again, right? So it was one of those moments, and I'm in the Kalahari with this elder Bushman healer, storyteller, profound dude named Kanama. And I lift up the thing, and I look at it, and then I hear him say something. I don't really like this to the, book, to the translator, and she starts laughing. And then I get embarrassed. Like, I feel the heat rising, you know, in my neck, right? And I'm like, what did I just do? And she's just laughing. And I said, what did he say? She said, he wants to know if that's a timepiece. And I looked at him, he's looking at me, and I'm like, yes, it's a timepiece. Well, he didn't say, what time is it? <laughs> he said, I don't like those things. And I'm like, why? And he says, because every time one of you visitors looks at one of those, the next thing you do is usually rude. <laughs> is rude a connective thing or a disconnective thing? You see what I'm saying about these people? They prize connection. They value it highly. It's super important to them. So is education. So is recreation. Any of you people who are competitive in sports, I challenge you to play their games with them and see what happens to you. I brought some very athletic, very capable humans. Phil is one of them. He probably got his butt kicked too in that one game with the stick, right? And the, the game looks so simple, but they just kick your butt. So they're very athletic. They're very healthy. And 90-year-old woman sits like this and works between her feet with a stick on a root. And then she stands up like this, wipes off her legs and then walks. And I have an exercise physiologist with me who's studying them. He's just like, their posture is perfect. Perfect. Everybody's posture is perfect. I have mental health people coming with me, and they're like, these people have like complete mental health positives. You know, they're super happy. They're super vital. You know, and then when you start looking at the attributes of connection, of course, they're totally connected from birth till death. Everybody. Western world, children are connected for a little while, some of them. And they get into the teen years, the connection attributes fall off. And then probably one out of a thousand adults discovers something that they really love to do in life again, and their connection attributes come back. But the rest of the adults flatline or drop off. So I started to think that connection attributes were for children, and that the teen years were the death knell for connection attributes, because that's what I only saw when I got to working with the son. I realized that their teenagers didn't lose their connection attributes. That's when my lights went on, because I started to think, we have a teen suicide crisis. The Bushmen don't have a teen suicide crisis. The Bushmen don't have autism, sensory process disorder, nature deficit disorder. They don't have depression. They don't have all these things. And I'm not talking about the Bushmen in the settlements because they have all those things. 
talking about the wild Bushmen living the ways of our ancestors. There's something in that formula that we really need. And the cool thing about it is that we can pull it out and apply it in modern times. It's not at odds with modern times. People aren't going to like the 45-minute greeting custom at first. <laughs> but we had a management consultant who came in and was trying to help fix our, our Eight Shields Institute organization. <laughs> And he said, we want you to, first thing you have to do is make sure you follow your core values. You have to live your core values, not just talk about them. So I'm like, okay. So what time is the meeting tomorrow? Nine o'clock. I'll be here at five to nine. I said, great. Shows up at five to nine. We hang out and have tea till about 9.30. We're all just talking and hanging out in the kitchen. He's looking at his watch. When are you going to get down to this meeting? What do you mean? We already are. You're not meeting. This is totally unproductive. I'm like, we're following our core values. You told us to follow our core values. What core values are you talking about? Laziness? <laughs> Sloppiness? And I'm like, no, we're greeting. We're wiping off the road dust. Ah, you know, six months later, he said, I've never worked with a more productive and creative team than this group. And he says, I'm now convinced it's in that 45 minutes of what I thought was wasted time that you're all really arriving, you're all developing trust, you're all seeing each other, you're all feeling comfortable and safe, and you're relaxing into your best, and then your connection system turns on, and then you perform at a higher level than most managers that I've been working with in really high-performing corporate settings. Yay! <laughs> Nature connection! Bing! You get that? This is practical stuff. It's just not well accepted at first, because we've all forgotten why it matters. The thing about Americans that I noticed, and I don't know about this is true with the Canadians, because there's a few Canadians in the room, so I'm going to talk about U.S. Americans. They don't know a damn thing about connecting with human beings. Get it all from the English, you know. Well, I can't say anything about England. I, I don't know anything about England, but I can tell you this about American adults. They can't connect with their husbands. They can't connect with their wives. They can't connect with their friends, really, anymore. And they can't connect with their children. But boy, can they connect with their dog. They connect so well with their dogs and their cats. And now in America, there's this like bizarre obsessive culture. And I think the dogs and the cats were sent by the creator to save the humans from themselves. <laughs> the very last thread of connective possibility. Seriously. And the dogs know people with the connection attributes. So if you have the eight attributes of connection, you walk into a party, the dog will find you and come straight to you. It'll go through the crowd and be like, oh, thank God. You're alive, right? You're alive. You are alive. Holy mackerel. This is so cool. Come on. Let's go do. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. We got. Come on. We're alive. Let's go. Come on. Let's get out of here. You know? And that's how the dogs treat people with the attributes of connection. The other thing is that the children find you too. They'll, you know, they'll be in the party. They'll be looking at all these legs and belts. And they'll be kind of walking around like, oh. And then they'll spot you and they'll be like, wow. Look at this one. And then, they, then they're over there and they're like interacting with you. They're like poking at you. They want to know what you are. Like, how come you're alive? We thought all of you were gone. Does anybody remember that when you were little and you were among adults and they just seemed like they weren't there? They were just sort of like belts and legs. <laughs> and they prepared things. And you went like this with your hands and you just grabbed it and then you ran off, right? So kids know where it's at. Dogs know where it's at. Cats know where it's at. So connection is important, but the attributes, because I'm not going to leave you without telling you. First attribute of connection is what we call the keystone attribute. And if you model things that get this attribute first, the other seven attributes come quicker. So we now strategically aim at this attribute. And we call it the quiet mind. A lot of, anybody meditate here? Yep, you want the quiet mind. Anybody do yoga in here? You also want the quiet mind. Anybody practice mindfulness in here? Okay, you are all quiet mind people. Do you like the quiet mind when you find it? Raise your hand if you think the quiet mind is cool. All right, good. So the quiet mind makes us more creative. It makes us more relaxed. It puts us in a better state of creativity. We perform better. We sleep better. Quiet mind is good. Okay? Now, when you drive the nature connection quiet mind, the other seven attributes come much quicker. So I think you have a sense of what the quiet mind is. The next attribute I'll tell you about is the attribute of happiness. And it's like a sparkle in the eye, rosy cheeks, like really prone to giggling. Happy, 
You know what that looks like? You've seen it? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> the, the second one I'll tell you about after the quiet mind and happiness is vitality. And it looks like this. Oh my God, <laughs> this is so great. What, when did you feel, somebody tell me the last time you felt that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay, when you walk in here, right on. You can't do a connection event. So, you know, kids have an experience and when they come to tell you about it, they're just like this, you know? <laughs> now that doesn't work well in the classroom in case any teachers in the room, you know what I'm talking about? The kid who has, that's a little challenging, but <laughs> from a connection standpoint, we need that. That's electricity, okay? To see a 90-year-old Bushman woman doing that, right? <laughs> She's like this, you know? That's vitality. The next one is very different from that one. The next one is like, when you tell me a story, I listen. I don't think about what I'm going to say while you're talking to me. That's New Jersey-style conversation. We call it intersecting monologues. <laughs> one person speaks. The other person kind of catches keywords, but is mostly thinking about what they're going to say. As soon as that person stops long enough, they're going to insert their monologue. And that's what we call conversation where I grew up. But that's not conversation in the Bushman world. In the Bushman world, when someone speaks, everyone drops into a silent place and listens really deeply. And it's a beautiful thing to have done for you. It feels helpful to be listened to in that way. I hope you all get to have that kind of listening every day. We had a, a study with the San people and we found out that the recommended daily allowance for listening <laughs> was you had at least three opportunities a day to do that. Three a day, and I've done all kinds of surveys in North America and found out people sometimes haven't had that in 20 years, okay? And we're talking three a day, 25 to 35 adults in your life who will do that for you. And most people can hardly name one person in modern times. So that's, that's loss of culture right there, in a nutshell, right? I think that's tragic. Children just need people to listen, really listen, not give advice. Because too often when a child tells an adult something, the adult's already trying to fix a problem. That's not unconditional listening. So that attribute I'm talking about now is the ability to listen without judgment. Just listen and catch the energy and pull it out and be with it. Maybe ask a question, but don't give advice. That's unconditional listening. Beautiful to see back in action. And then the next one is called empathy. Empathy is a really important one. We could use a lot more right now on the planet. I think you would agree. If you re are reading headlines, you're seeing a lot of evidence of lack of empathy right now around our planet. Um, the next one is being truly helpful. And if you combine empathy with nature, with the truly helpful attribute, you've got conservation right there. That's responsible environmental behavior. That's the end of consumerism. Right there. If you could get people into empathy and the helpful nature, those two things would prevent all the insanity in, in our global economic system, because that's just runaway consumerism right now, you know? And that's just disconnected behavior. That's all that is, you know? It's not people are bad. Shopping isn't bad. Well, sometimes it is, but, you know, it is reckless because we're out of connection with where everything is really coming from. We're not in touch with the cycles of things, you know? The next one, and by the way, every child that I've mentored in this way has grown up to be very conservation-oriented, very, very sustainably minded. You know, they're very much involved in taking care of their people, taking care of the earth. You know, and the more I see that, the more I just think every child needs this, right? Because that could really help. The next one is being in love with life itself, like knowing that life is so precious, you're, you are actually alive. And what a blessing that is, that to wake up in the morning and realize I'm alive and be like, wow, I'm not always going to be alive, but I'm alive. That's so cool. And of course, that triggers this, you know, <laughs> right? Those two are related. The next one is love, compassion, forgiveness. That's the last one. That's the eighth one. Well, people who get really connected and have to work through a lot of things around what connection brings up, they learn to be forgiving and compassionate. Again, we need a lot more of that, right? All this is backed with tons of research. Humans become better when they're connected in the way that they're designed to be connected. 